All right, everyone, it's 12.30. Let's get started. I hope you've had a good lunch. How many of you specifically invited a friend or a coworker this week? Busted. That's your assignment every week, specifically invite someone. They don't, no, they don't count if they already come. <clears throat> yes, continue, continue to get the word out and let people know the best kept lunch secret in Charlotte. And today's food looked really good, by the way. Um, there's some left over if you want some to go, you can always take that as well. Or if you come in late and you don't have time to get something, <clears throat> that's always an option. So we are picking back up. Last week, Deuteronomy chapter 8 was a warning to Israel against material pride. When, when God prospers them, it was a warning against becoming prideful, thinking that they had somehow earned the blessing that they had been given. This week, the chapter is a warning against the flip side of a coin, which is spiritual pride. And the belief that God is doing all this stuff because of something that Israel had done in terms of their righteousness. And God, Moses, is going to emphatically dispel that myth uh, once and for all in Deuteronomy 9. Deuteronomy 9 is a chapter whenever people start to have, whether in the Old Covenant, Israel, or the New Covenant, <clears throat> believers today start to feel pride or start to feel like we somehow deserve or God is, if God judges other people, that is therefore Him praising us. Deuteronomy 9 is a chapter that comes in and just shatters that and says absolutely not. And so what we're going to read here, we pick it up right up in chapter uh, 9, verse 1. <clears throat> Actually, back up a verse, uh, two verses. Chapter 8, verse 19 says, If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you that you will surely be destroyed. It's talking to Israel here. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you will be destroyed for not obeying the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, listen up Israel is what he's saying, you are now about to cross the Jordan and go in and dispossess nations greater and stronger than you, with large cities that have walls up to the sky. The people are strong and tall. The Anakites, and we talked about how Anakites was almost a term that means like boogeymen. Uh, it just had these connotations of like strong, fierce like overpowering, legendary people. So it's not a specific people group necessarily, but just a term of like awesome, fearful, mighty warriors that describes the people of this land. And that's what the spies that had rebelled against Moses initially said. They came back and brought that report. We can't take the land. The people are too mighty. They're too strong. We even saw Anakites there. So <clears throat> what Moses is saying is, yeah, those people are all there, but you know about them, and I've heard it said, who can stand up against the Anakites? Like, that's their reputation. But be assured today that the Lord your God is the one who goes across ahead of you like a devouring fire. He will destroy them. He will subdue them before you. And you will drive them out and annihilate them quickly as the Lord has promised you. Here's that tension again. God is doing it, but it will involve you doing it. Divine sovereignty. God is going to do it. God will drive them out. Human responsibility. You must drive them out. You must annihilate them. They work together. They're not in conflict. <clears throat> and so then it says, verse 4, after the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, or literally says, do not say in your heart, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No. It's not on account of the wickedness. No, excuse me, no, it is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It's not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you're going in to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand then that, third time, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God is giving you this good land to possess. For you are a stiff-necked people. You're a difficult people. Difficult of neck is what the Hebrew says. And it means like an animal, when you try to lead a, a donkey or you lead a cattle or you lead something with the reins and it stiffens its neck and pulls away and it, can't, it won't go where you're trying to. You're trying to lead it to water. You're trying to lead it to food. And it just won't go. 
Those of you who've ever have, if you have a dog that's never wanted to go on a walk and you want to take him for a walk and it stiffens the neck or you want to take him to the vet to heal him and he's, nah. it's like that, stiff necked. That's the image that God gives of Israel. So three times he repeats it. He says, I, I've made a promise to your ancestor. Anybody remember where this promise was made? We've repeated it multiple times. Genesis 15, one person's paying attention. Yes, Genesis 15. God promised Abraham, I'll bring your descendants out in the fourth generation because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure now. Meaning, in that time, which is where we are now, the sin of the Amorites, the sin of those people, will have reached its full measure and they will be ripe for judgment. Israel has to always remember God giving them the promised land was never, never based on them being righteous and having a right to the land. Ever. It was always based on the promise God made to Abraham and on the judgment of the wicked nations. That's why God was driving them out. These specific nations, these seven groups of nations, God, and we say nations, they're city-states. They're, they're not even nations. It'd be like neighborhoods almost. But these people groups are who God is exercising His judgment on, and His judgment is going to be on Israel. But that doesn't mean that Israel gets, therefore, a blank check from God. It doesn't mean that Israel gets a divine stamp of approval as righteous. Moses is making it clear that that's not the case because later in Israel's history, God's going to do this exact same thing to Israel through the Babylonians. And He's going to do exactly the same. The book of Habakkuk is a whole book about the prophet Habakkuk just being bewildered. How can God, you're bringing this horrible pagan nation in to drive us out? They don't even love you. They don't even worship you. They don't even follow you. How can this be? And God tells Habakkuk, oh, it can be because I'm judging you the way I judged the Canaanites. And I'm using this nation Babylon to do it. That doesn't mean that God, that Babylon was righteous. It meant that God was going to use an unrighteous people to drive out another unrighteous people because God does that as the sovereign king of kings. And then God would, through the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, prophesy judgment against Babylon for their role in it and how they delighted in destroying and oppressing God's people. So in the end, no sin goes unpunished. And God doesn't play favorites. But this chapter is incredibly important because what it's going to set the stage for in the next section of Israel's history, the conquest, would give somebody the idea if they hadn't read what's come before that Israel was God's mighty army because of something inherently good about Israel. And Moses is going to no, you're God's instrument. You're His instrument of judgment. And you get your, your, your relationship, your covenant favor is contingent on your obedience to the covenant, not your identity as people of Israel. We've said that before, but it's all throughout the Torah from Genesis on. Covenant relationship was never contingent on who your parents were. It was always contingent on who your God is. Who you are obedient to. And that's what Moses is trying. He's pleading with Israel because it would be so easy to think if God's judging this nation and He's using us to do it, it must, mean, must be because we're the good guys. And God's saying, no, do not think that. Do not think that. God can use bad guys to judge other bad guys. So he goes on then and he says, verse 7, remember this. And he's going to give them a memory lesson. Now, before he launches into this, he's going to talk about the events we've read in Exodus and in Numbers. Remember, the generation that Moses is talking to right now, most of them weren't alive when these things happened. If they were, they were kids. So he is going to identify them with their parents corporately because he's speaking to the people of Israel corporately. So the people, even though they weren't alive at the time, they are standing in the place of Israel, this generation, and they are being called to look back because they will need to give an account for the sins that their parents had committed, not in the sense of being punished for it, but in the sense of saying, yes, we did that. We are changing. We as a people are repenting. We as a people are turning. So there's an element of, of, of corporate solidarity is the theological term. Corporate solidarity doesn't sit well in America. 
because we are not a nation of corporate solidarity. We're a nation of individual rights. And so this rubs against our sense of fairness. But in the Bible, there is a, such a thing where you are identified with the people to whom you belong. And so when the people as a whole commit sin, you share in the identity. Now, it doesn't mean God punishes you for sins you didn't commit, but it does mean that you as a people have a responsibility corporately to disassociate with those sins even if you weren't the one that committed them. This is why things like, like reconciliation ceremonies take place after generations or even after centuries when one people group has, has oppressed another people group, then there will be sometimes that people group, none of whom are alive still, will recognize that they, the group that they are part of at one time in the past did some things that need to be repented of. And so corporately there will be a sense of like, corporately we are seeking repentance, restoration, and forgiveness. And so you'll do that. That's why different churches, in fact, will, will do that with various groups. So there'll be churches that have in South Africa, for instance, during apartheid, that will repent of that. Even if they weren't necessarily doing it, they will corporately repent of it. Or there will be uh, churches like Methodist Church. We have a, a ceremony of repentance to Native Americans. It's like, well, I never drove anyone off their land, but the people from whom I come did. And so I'm recognizing that happened. And I'm recognizing it was a people group doing it to another people group. And so I am standing in their place asking for forgiveness, even though I didn't do anything. We see Daniel do this. When Daniel, when Israel's in exile, Daniel confesses sins that Daniel did not commit. But he's doing it corporately identifying with the people and asking forgiveness on their behalf. So it's this balance. We need to hold it. You know, God doesn't punish somebody for doing something that they did not do. He does specifically say, I will not punish the innocent for the sin of the guilty. But He does speak to groups in a corporate sense and, and require corporate righteousness, uprightness, which sometimes means having to repudiate things that we specifically didn't do, but that were done by people we identify with. And how that works out in, in everything from social issues to politics to world events, you're free to debate and, and discuss and figure that out in your own churches and groups, but the concepts are very biblical in terms of that notion. Yes, individual responsibility is present in Scripture, but corporate identity is also present in Scripture. And we have to hold that balance so we don't slip into individualism, which just denies sins of the past and, and, and acts as if they play no part in what's happening today, versus the identity politics, which says everything that happens today is based on this who's part of what people and who oppressed who, and everything is filtered through that lens. The biblical authors, like in almost every issue, provide us with a beautiful picture of balance that we as Christians can take into the world when these issues do arise and tell both sides of whatever debate, hey, guys, slow down, listen to each other, and then look at Scripture and see what God's heart is on this issue. And it'll manifest itself in different ways. But again, the concept is there. And so Moses is going to speak to this generation and tell them, you did this, even though they specifically individually did not. But corporately, the people of Israel did. And so he's reminding them so that they can distance themselves from it going forward when they make this covenant ceremony, which the whole book of Deuteronomy is. So he says, Remember this and never forget how you provoked the Lord your God to anger in the desert from the day you left Egypt until you arrived here. Remember, most of them weren't even alive when they left Egypt. From the day you left Egypt until you arrived here, you have been rebellious against the Lord. At Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, you aroused the Lord's wrath so that He was angry enough to destroy you. When I went up on the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord God had made with you, I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I ate no bread. I drank no water. The Lord gave me two stone tablets inscribed by the finger of God. On them were all the commands the Lord proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. That's the Ten Commandments. This is Exodus 20. God in an audible voice spoke the ten words to the people and the people freaked out. And they said, Moses, this is too much. You go talk to him. We'll stay down here. So Moses does that, and this is when the covenant is being given. While that very covenant is being given, 
verse 11, at the end of the 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant. Then the Lord told me, go down from here at once because your people whom you have brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've turned away quickly from what I commanded them and have made a cast idol for themselves. So God now in this instance when Moses is speaking, God tells Moses, hey, your people are going crazy. The people who you brought up. In other words, God is, God is identifying Moses with the people. And Moses now in this section of the speech is identifying this generation with that previous generation. So this sense of corporate solidarity. But Moses is going to push back, and it's really interesting what happens as a result of this. It's almost as if God's entering down into this realm where he kind of gets into a, I wouldn't say argument, but a back and forth with somebody. He's done it with Abraham. He's done it with Jacob. He's doing it with Moses. So, but right now it seems as if all is lost. The Lord said, verse 13, I have seen this people and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. Now leave me alone so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. So God tells Moses, I'm, I'm done with these people. Now get out of my way let me, so I can destroy them. Why would Mo, God need to tell Moses to get out of his way to do anything? You get the sense this is not God speaking in absolutes. This is God giving Moses, just like he did with Abraham and before he sent judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, giving Moses a chance to do what Abraham did for Sodom and Gomorrah, which is to intercede. God is divinely condescending to entering into a discussion when he could have just snapped his finger and all of Israel's destroyed. He doesn't. So, verse 15, So I turned and went down from the mountain while it was ablaze with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked, I saw that you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way the Lord God had commanded you. So I took the two stone tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them to pieces before your eyes. The two tablets, remember, they were two copies of the covenant. This is a suzerainty treaty covenant. You make two copies. One copy in the temple of your God. One copy would go back in the temple of the suzerain's God so that both people were heir to the treaty, had copies of it in their temples. Moses has two copies. God gives him two copies because the temple of Moses' people, the tabernacle, is going to be the throne room of God himself. And that's why the two copies are kept together because this God, this suzerain, lives in and among his vassal, unlike any other suzerain did in the ancient Near East. And but when the people, when Moses sees what the people have done, they've broken the first two commands. The very first two commands. No other gods before me, no graven images. He immediately sees, well, they've broken the first two. That's it. I mean, that's that's the they, oh, I don't need to wait anymore. This this covenant's broken. So he throws the tablets down, shattering them. Not because he's pitching a fit. Not because he's just frustrated. No, he's symbolically tearing up the contract. That's what the actions would have meant to the people. This is the tablet, this is the covenant, and you've broken it. Well, bam, shattered. Because that's the relationship between you and God now. It's shattered because of your disobedience. After three times saying, we'll do everything the Lord's commanded, this is what they do. So God has every legal right in the ancient Near East to destroy this people. From a, from a purely legal perspective of how vassals and suzerains were to relate to each other and the stipulations of the covenant, God has every right to destroy these people. And Moses knows this. So, <clears throat> verse 18, Then again I fell prostrate before the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. This is the events of Exodus 32, which in Exodus 32, they just telescope it into one... Like, it's almost like in Exodus 32, you read it, it's like Moses sees the people, breaks the tablet, comes down, burns the stone, uh, the golden calf, puts it in the fire, makes them drink it, then prays to the God. Like it's all told at a very fast pace. But what we re just learn here is that some things happened during that time. One of which Moses entered into another 40-day period. So there was at least a 40-day gap between the golden calf incident and God's judgment or whether God's judgment would happen or not. There was another 40-day period where the people waited in uncertainty just like they had done when Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And that's what led them to do the golden calf thing to begin with. Well, he's been up there 40 days, 40 nights. He's not coming back. We need to make our own gods. Now they've done that. They see that God's judgment is ripe and he's angry. So Moses makes them, okay, now there's going to be another 
40 days and 40 nights of uncertainty while I go pray that God doesn't destroy you. So Moses stepping in, interceding. Um, so I ate no bread and drank no water because of all the sin you had committed, doing what's evil in the Lord's sight, and so provoking him to anger. Verse 19, I feared the anger and wrath of the Lord, for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. But again, the Lord listened to me. The Lord was even angry enough with Aaron to destroy him, but at that time I prayed for Aaron too. This explains why Aaron didn't get destroyed in that incident. Back in Genesis or Exodus 32, people wondered, like, wait a minute, why did Aaron get off scot-free? He was the one that made the thing. And the other people get punished, but he doesn't. And we find out here, Moses specifically pleaded on behalf of the people and specifically for his brother Aaron. Verse 21, Also, I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf you had made, and I burned it in the fire. And I crushed it, ground it to a powder as fine as dust, and threw the dust into the stream that flowed down the mountain. This was their drinking water supply, their spring that came up from the rock that had been split, and the water provided enough uh, drinking water for the people. And Moses throws the burnt calf into that, making the people drink it. In Exodus 32, it just said he made the people drink it. So you get the image of like Moses walking around with a cup, like you drink this and you drink this. Well, now we see how he made them drink it. He put it in the only source of water that they had. So that, again, them realizing uh, completely destroying and doing away with this idolatrous thing. Not melting the gold down and using it for a noble purpose or anything like that, but like utterly destroying it. And so, <clears throat> that was one incident. <laughs> Verse 22, You also made the Lord angry at Tabera. That's where they complained and, and threatened to revolt and God sent fire to burn the outskirts of the camp. That's Numbers 11. And at Massa, that's where they complained again because God wasn't giving them water to drink after he had done the miracles of Egypt. And so he told Moses, fine, strike the rock. And Moses struck the rock and water came out. But the place was called Massa as a result because Massa means testing or, or, or grumbling against or putting God, putting God to the test is uh, how it's translated in Exodus 17. And at Kibroth Hatavah, that's the place where they were all buried. After God, the people cried out again, almost threatening to rebel. God gave them manna, and they were like, we don't want this. We're tired of this manna stuff. We want meat. The guy was like, you want meat? Okay, I'll give you meat. And sent a bunch of quail, and then the people were just devouring the quail and being gluttons, and, 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 and God struck a plague among them. And so it, the place that was named Graves of Craving or Gluttony, or, that's what Kibroth HaTavah means. So these three instances, that's Numbers 11 as well. So these three instances Moses is recalling, hey, don't think that this rebellion thing is a one-time deal. You guys have a history of rebelling. You're, you as my people have a history of being stiff-necked, and this is not a one-time occurrence. So he's making them realize the depth and the seriousness because it's really easy for us to go, well, that was our parents' generation, right? It'd be really easy for them to go, yeah, but that was our parents' generation. You know, every generation blames the one before it. Like millennials, well, it's the, uh, you know, the Gen X's made all the problems. And Gen X's are like, no, the baby boomers are the ones that screwed everything up. And the boomers are like, no, we, you know, well, they're not even alive, the previous generation. But this is the constant temptation of every generation is to blame or to distance themselves from the previous generation as if they're not the heirs of that, as if they're not carrying on the legacy of that. And, and so Moses is, is kind of holding that intention and saying, no, look, this is the type of people you have been from the beginning. It's a pattern of behavior that has repeated itself. And it's going to continue to repeat itself in the future. I mean, we know from hindsight, this is not going to be an aberration. This will be the norm for Israel. You just read the book of Judges, it makes it crystal clear. This is the nature of Israel. Why? Because it's the nature of humanity. It's the nature of humanity to rebel. It's the nature of humanity to resent authority. It's the nature of humanity to desire our own cravings. It's the nature of humanity to put God to the test. It's the nature of humanity to grumble when we don't get what we want. That's human nature. So God pulls Israel out, but even Israel, His means of rescue the entire world, even Israel is, is, is manifesting what's common to all mankind. These tendencies. And so God, Moses is reminding them of that, calling that to mind and making sure that they can never forget it. 
in verse 23, the ultimate, when, when the Lord sent you out from Kadesh Barnea, this is the spies that went up into the land, and He said, go up and take possession of the land I've given you. But you rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You did not trust Him or obey Him. You've been rebellious against the Lord ever since I've known you. I lay prostrate before the Lord those 40 days and 40 nights. It jumps back to the golden calf thing. Because the Lord had said He would destroy you. I prayed to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, do not destroy your people, your own inheritance that you redeemed by your great power and brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Overlook the stubbornness of this people, their wickedness and their sin. Otherwise, the country from which you brought us will say, because the Lord was not able to take them into the land He promised them, and because He hated them, He brought them out and put them to death in the desert. But they are your people, your inheritance that you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Moses has the audacity to correct God. When God says, your people who you brought out, it's almost as if he's giving Moses a chance to take some credit. And Moses rightfully goes, no, 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 no. These are your people. You brought them out by your hand, your power, your outstretched arm. He reminds God, as if God needs reminding, he reminds God of the facts. He gets it right. It's a powerful image and it's a powerful um, uh, illustration of God stepping down into human relationship and giving the, the Moses a chance to basically argue back with him, but in the right way. And the Bible's filled with this, with people uh, seeming to argue with God or cry out against God, or some people even seeming to correct God, but not in an unpious way, not in an unbelieving way, but in a believing way. Because what Moses is saying to God is true. He's not saying something false. He's not blaming God for something God didn't do, as other people will do at times. He's saying, no, God, you did this. These are your people. Please don't blot them out. Your reputation is on the line. If you destroy this people, all of what you did to the gods of Egypt through those plagues will be for naught. Because the whole world that looks on and sees that will say, oh, he just brought them out to kill them. That's the kind of God he is. A vengeful, angry, capricious, uh, bloodthirsty God. And Moses knows that's not the case. And so he pleads with God based on God's own reputation. And, and appeals to God's own reputation and appeals to the nations who will see what's happening. Moses gets it. Moses realizes this is the plan God made to Abraham that through Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth will be redeemed. They'll be blessed. They'll be brought into relationship with God. How can that happen if God destroys them in the sight of all the nations of the world? Like Moses, has an eye, Moses has the understanding of what God is doing. Now, he doesn't, he doesn't have an image of Jesus who will come and actually do it and how it will work out, but he has enough of the story, enough of the promise to know that if God does wipe these people out, which they do deserve, then that will put God in a very precarious place in terms of the promise that he's made. And Moses doesn't know how that would be, could be redeemed i mean god could do it jesus had said god can raise up seed of abraham even from these rocks that's not a problem but moses doesn't have all of that knowledge in his mind he's just saying like god you can't do it because of who you are and because of what this plan is and because of what the whole purpose of what we're doing is in the sight of the nations and so uh, verse, yeah, verse 29. And then it bleeds into chapter 10. So it says, At the time, the Lord said to me, Chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and come up to me on the mountain. And also make a wooden chest. I'll write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Then you're to put them into the chest. So I made the ark out of acacia wood and chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones. I went up the mountain with the two tablets in my hands. The Lord wrote on these tablets what He had written before. The Ten Commandments He had proclaimed to you on the mountain out of the fire on the day of the assembly. Exodus 20. And the Lord gave them to me. Then I came back down the mountain and put the tablets in the ark I had made as the Lord commanded me. And they are there now. So this is is powerful because what God basically did, and all the people would know this, this imagery, the covenant gets rewritten. The contract gets renewed. It was shattered. It was destroyed. 
Moses interceded, and this all happens in the chapters after Exodus 32, so you can, that's where we are if you want to go back and see how it happened and the back and forth between Moses and God, <clears throat> get more detail. But the main thing is Moses is reminding the people, you broke the covenant. I pleaded on your behalf. God restored the covenant. God gave you a mulligan. He gave you a do-over. He gave you a chance to, to, to be reinstated as his instrument people. So all of this feeding into what he began this section with, don't think that because God is driving out these Canaanites before you, that that means therefore that you are righteous. Because God can use even bent instruments to get his will done. You know, God can use uh, uh, whatever he will. Remember, God can speak through a donkey he can pretty much use anything he wants to accomplish his will. So this is really important. And, and this it has implications uh, far outside of, of personal piety. It has implications of uh, just anything. And whenever we look at the world, whenever we're tempted to separate the world, and especially the secular world, into good guys and bad guys, we've already strayed. Because there aren't really any good guys. There can be good causes and there can be wicked causes, but we can't confuse that with, well, that means these are the good guys and these are the bad guys. And the bad that one person does can, was never uh, justification or is never a testimony to the good of the other. Bad people can do bad things to other bad people all the time. Uh, and that's just the fallen world that we live in. But in all of that, God is moving and using a people that he calls out of the badness of humanity and enters into covenant relationship with and writes his commandments on their hearts as we're going to see in the New Testament whereas at this point it was on stone tablets, and uses that people to then take his kingdom, which is not of this world, out into all corners of the world. And so that's where we find ourselves. We're going to pick back up next week with the rest of chapter 10, uh, and, and, and Moses wrapping up this kind of history lesson. Or it's not even, it's a sermon, basically, again. And we'll see what his commandments are to the people then.